a drink and make yourselves comfortable. Today we're going to talk about dose response curves. Now typically the only curves I pay attention to are on a prod. I'm joking. But seriously, these puppies give us an easy way to compare therapies. To get started, let's take a peek at the curve for a drug we have in development, Retrofan. Now the x-axis on bottom here is how much drug we've administered, or the dose. To the left on the y-axis is how much activity we get from the given dose. The actual curve shows how much of a response is generated by a given dose. There's one point on the curve I'd like to point out, the EC50. This point lies halfway between the baseline and the maximal effect we can achieve. For this next part, we'll need some more data. Johnson, get in here with the new trial data. Thank you, Johnson. What have we got on this first one? In the light blue, you'll see the curve for Retrofan. We've been developing a new drug that's supposed to be more potent, Antikavan. Yes, I see the curve for Antikavan is more to the left. How's that rate? Well, drugs which are more potent will have a curve which lies more to the left. Ah, so what else do you have for me? In our search for a more potent form of Retrofan, we came across another agonist. However, this one does produce the full effects of Retrofan. Again, Retrofan's in the light blue, and Fabulin. What gives? That curve doesn't reach as high. As I said, the drug doesn't produce the full effects of Retrofan. It's what we call a partial agonist. It just isn't as effective, and that's why the curve is lower. So the higher the curve, the more effective. Precisely. And how much did we spend developing this dud? Uh, moving on, we have another curious compound, flux capacitine which we found to be a fairly strong inverse agonist. What's that mean? The inverse agonist produces the opposite pharmacological response. For example, where Retrofan produces that nice, warm, nostalgic feeling, flux capacitine leaves you feeling scared amidst the unknown future. Brilliant. What's next? We've got a couple antagonists. Now, these won't do anything on their own. They simply block Retrofan from interacting with its receptor. In the presence of Retrofan, however, They'll make it less potent and less effective. That curves much further to the right than the original. Yes, that's our competitive antagonist, Snapactum. While it blocks Retrofan from binding, it doesn't make it impossible. With a high enough dose of Retrofan, we can start to achieve the same effects as before. So it's made it less potent, and that's why it's shifted to the right? Exactly. This next one's a non-competitive or an irreversible antagonist. Oh, well, that doesn't sound friendly. With these, the antagonist binds strongly to the receptor, so no matter how much retrofan you give, you never achieve the same potency or effects. And that's why the curve is so small and to the right? Yes, sir. So let's make sure I've got this straight. The further to the left the curve is, the more potent it is? Correct. And the higher the curve reaches on the graph, the more effective it is. Also correct. Well, excellent. That was very helpful. Just don't forget, this is an oversimplified model. It doesn't take into account many variables which can affect how the drug works. But we're just a cartoon, so we'll keep it simple. <laughs> That's what she said. Wait, what? I should also mention the drugs can allosterically potentiate or inhibit. That is, they can bind to a different site on the receptor and cause it to respond better or worse to the other ligands. Well, thank you, Johnson. This has been very informative. If you excuse me, I have to refresh my drink. Sir, you know the company's policy on alcohol... Uh, thank you, Johnson.